It's TV school time. WOI TV, in association with Iowa State Teachers College, presents another program in the Iowa TV school time series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic is Keokuk. Your teacher is Herb Haig of the Iowa State Teachers College. Hello, boys and girls. I was just admiring this statue of Keokuk back here. But I'm a little worried about the old gentleman. You see, he's standing up there on that pedestal, looking out over the Mississippi River. And for a cold day like this, he has on a pretty sketchy outfit. It's mainly feathers. You notice? Oh, he's got a blanket over his shoulders, but mainly that's a war bonnet that he's wearing. This is slightly larger than life size. And it is a statue that covers the mortal remains of Chief Keokuk, a chief of the Sacks and the Foxes. But that's no costume to wear on a cold day. You notice I bought myself a new overcoat. I've been trying to get over this miserable cold I've had for the last three weeks. And I thought if I was coming up here on this hill in Keokuk today, I'd better wear some warm clothes. So I got this new overcoat. I'll bet I'm warmer than Keokuk is. See, this statue stands in Rand Park, which is on the north edge of the city of Keokuk. And this is right near the edge of the Mississippi River. Mississippi flows along on that side over there, toward the east. And of course, it is very wide now because when the Keokuk Dam was completed in 1913, the waters were backed up, and the river here is now about two miles wide. So if Keokuk were alive today, he wouldn't even recognize the Mississippi River. Much wider now than it was during his lifetime. But this is a beautiful statue, and it does honor to the memory of a great chief in Indian history. The irony of all this is, though, that Keokuk didn't live here in Keokuk. The city of Keokuk was named after the chief. But the county is not named after Chief Keokuk. It is named after Albert Lee. This is Lee County. Let me show you on the map just where Keokuk is. Keokuk is way down here in southeastern Iowa, here at the junction of the Des Moines and the Mississippi Rivers. See, the Des Moines flows in here and produces what have been called for a long time the rapids of the River Des Moines, which are in the Mississippi River, as I told you last week. Well, here is Keokuk, and this is Lee County down here. Lee County, named after Lieutenant Albert M. Lee, who gave Iowa its name. That is a book which Lieutenant Albert Lee wrote called Notes on the Wisconsin Territory, calls attention to the fact that a tribe of Indians named the Iowas, I-O-W-A-Y-S, lived in this land here, and that the name aptly could describe this particular country. So Lieutenant Lee's notes on the Wisconsin Territory first gave Iowa its name, Iowa. And they decided to name this county down here after Lieutenant Albert Lee, whose name was spelled L-E-A, but somehow the man who wrote this out didn't make a very good A and it was read as an E. So this is L-E-E -E County, Lee. But it's named after Lieutenant Albert Lee, L-E-A. <coughs> now Keokuk County is further north. And Keokuk actually lived up here on the Iowa River. Not down here. Later on, when he was pushed further west, he lived over here on the Des Moines River. But never down here. Well, the story of Keokuk is a very interesting one. 
and perhaps I ought to show you some pictures of some famous Indians. This is not Keokuk. This is Black Hawk, who is perhaps more widely known than Keokuk himself. Black Hawk and Keokuk were both sacks, or socks, S-A-U-K or S-A-C. They're both the same. Depends on how you spell it. S-A-U-K is the older name, and both Black Hawk and Keokuk were born in Sokanook, which was the Indian name of the place that is now called Rock Island in Illinois. Now, the Sacs and the Foxes are two entirely different tribes. Sometimes we say the Sac and the Fox, as though they were one nation. The Sac and the Fox were together only for a brief time, and Keokuk was the chief of both tribes. But basically, the two were separate nations. The legend is that Gitche Manitou, the great spirit, created an Indian out of yellow earth and called this Indian the Sauk, or the Yellow Earth Indian. And then later on, he made an Indian out of Red Earth, and this became the Sac, or the Sauk. And interestingly enough, <coughs> that is not the real name of the nation either. The, the Fox, the Fox Indians, did I say Sac and Fox, or Sac and Sauk, the Sac or the Sauk are the Yellow Earth Indians, and the Fox are the Red Earth Indians. The real name of the Fox Indians is Meskwaki, the Meskwaki Indians. And they got this name, the Fox, from the French, who called the Indians Renards. Renard is French for a fox, you see. But the real name of the Red Earth Indians is Meskwaki. And if you go to the Tama Indian settlement today, you will find the Meskwaki Indians. They prefer to be known as Meskwakis because that is the original name. They are also Fox Indians, but really they are Meskwaki. Well, getting back to Black Hawk and Keokuk, they were Sacks or Sauks. Black Hawk, who was the older of the two, that is, he was older than Keokuk, was a fighter. He didn't like the way the white people were encroaching upon the Indian lands. He didn't like the way they were pushing the Indians around. And he wanted to fight. Black Hawk is perhaps the most picturesque figure of the two. That is, we feel a little bit sorry for Black Hawk because the Indians in general were pushed around a great deal by the early traders and settlers. And Black Hawk felt that he should fight back. He felt that the Indians were being cheated. And he is the man who led the Black Hawk War, of which we'll say a little more a little bit later on. This, however, is Keokuk. Now, Keokuk here in this picture looks older than Black Hawk, doesn't he? But this drawing was made from a photograph taken when Keokuk was an old man. And Keokuk, at the time he was chief, at the time he first became chief, was much younger than this and much more vigorous and much more stalwart and a much more imposing figure. Keokuk was a man of peace. He believed in peace at any price. He saw quite early that the white men were coming in greater numbers than the Indians and that there was no sense in trying to fight the white man. And so he decided to join them. Instead of fighting them, he joined them. And he was willing to make any kind of concession to the white men in order to have peace. When the white men became so many on the east side of the Mississippi that there wasn't much room left for the Indians, he was advised to move west of the Mississippi. And he didn't argue about it. He just moved and settled over on the Iowa River. Black Hawk wasn't quite so easy to persuade. And later on, when the white men became even more numerous, and began to occupy Sokanook and to plow up the Indians' cornfields and even the Indians' graveyards, Black Hawk became very, very angry and went west of the Mississippi to appeal to Keokuk's warriors to fight back. And we'll hear a little more about that, too, later. I wanted you, first of all, to have a picture of these two men and to recognize what the difference 
between the men. Keokuk was a man of peace. Black Hawk was a man of war. Keokuk was willing to have peace at any price, even though it meant sacrificing his honor and the rights of his people. Black Hawk was determined to fight for his lands and for his Indian rights. Now, perhaps I ought to show you a picture of Keokuk which shows him as a younger man. Here is a picture of Keokuk. This was painted in Washington, D.C. by an artist employed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this is one of Keokuk's sons. Now, this is Keokuk as he was at the time of his vigorous manhood. But even now, even at this time, he was a man of peace. He could fight. He could fight like a demon if he had to. And there are many stories about the way in which Keokuk was able to fight the Sioux Indians. He didn't fight the white man, but he would fight the Sioux, who were the enemies of the Sac and the Fox. Here is a picture over here of another famous Indian in Iowa history. This is Powashik. Powashik also had a county named after him in Iowa. But Powashik was a fox chief. And here is Wapalo, who was also a fox chief or a Meskwaki chief. And down here at the bottom of the page is a picture of Mahaska, who also had a county in Iowa named after him. Now, all of these pictures were painted in Washington when these Indians came to visit the great white father and to ask for their rights as the earliest settlers in America. At the time Mahaska visited Washington, he drank a little too much fire water, and he began beating his wife in the hotel room where he had been allowed to stay. And his wife began to yell, and the police came running. And Mahaska, who was a little bit confused by all this whiskey he had had, walked right out of a second-story window. And he broke his arm in the fall. I don't know if it was in the fall that he was there, but in the fall from the window he broke his arm. And when he had this picture painted the next day, he still had his arm in a sling. See? That isn't a blanket, that's a sling. This picture was painted while Mahaska had a broken arm because he walked out of a second-story window while he was drunk. <clears throat> there is an issue of the palimpsest which tells the story of Keokuk and some of the other Indians. And you'll notice on the cover here there is a drawing of a man on a horse. That is a picture of Keokuk when he was a mighty chieftain. And the picture was drawn by George Catlin, who is one of the most famous of all Indian painters, or who was, he's long gone now. But George Catlin made his trip among the Indians and painted their pictures at the time that they were still alive. He painted these from life. And in his journal, Catlin remarks upon the fact that he was surprised that Keokuk had such a beautiful horse. That looks almost like a thoroughbred. But he learned that he had paid $300 for this horse and that he had a, a real taste for good horses. And as a chief, he could get the best. Well, this is the palimpsest for July 1958. July 1958. And if you want a complete story of Keokuk, write to the State Historical Society in Iowa City for this issue. Remember to send 25 cents, because that's the cost of the palimpsest. Now, we sometimes imagine when we talk about the Indians that they were pretty primitive and that they had to make do with all sorts of primitive weapons and implements, but they were highly ingenious. Now, I'm sure many of you boys and girls have found Indian arrowheads in plowed fields. There's hardly a place anywhere in Iowa where you can't find some of these Indian relics. 
but I brought along with me today a number of Indian weapons to show you what a wide variety of materials they use. Now this is a spearhead made out of chert. See how light it is in color? And here is an arrowhead of flint. That almost looks like it's stained with the blood of a buffalo or something, doesn't it? But that's the way the flint is. Flint can be found in many, many different colors, all the way from white to black. And this, this is flint. Here is a flint spear point. You see, the, the shaft was tied on here with deep thongs. And uh, notice how serrated the edge is, the little bumps on the edge. That's so that if the spear once hit an animal, the animal couldn't shake it out. That isn't just a crude way to shape a spear point. They did that on purpose. And they chipped this flint with elk's antlers. Here is a spear point made out of jasper, a red stone. And I bet you can't tell me what material this is. Of course, if you were here to feel it, you could probably tell. But that is an arrowhead made out of lead. You see, there was a lot of lead here in the Iowa country where Keokuk established his village. And the Indians soon discovered that this lead could be shaped into arrowheads. And it was a lot less work than it was chipping them out of flint because lead was much softer. This is quartzite. You can see the little sandy surface on the top here. This is a scraper. All of these things that you find are not necessarily spear points or arrowheads, you see. This, however, is another spear point. This also is quartzite. You can tell by the rough, sandy surface. And this is granite. This is a granite hammer. See, the handle was, was tied on here. And there's quite a sharp edge on there. Yep. Even after all these years. And it could be turned around. And in a fight, this uh, would leave quite an impression upon a person's head. This is basalt. This is black. Now, this is a, a chopper held in the hand, like that. This didn't have a handle tied to it. Many of these implements were used as hand tools. And here is something which you'll probably recognize. This is pipestone. And this was found in the pipestone quarry. And the Indians always made a trip to the pipestone quarry in what is now Minnesota to get this reddish stone for their calumets, or peace pipes. They sawed it out like this, or chipped it out. This is a modern piece of uh, pipe stone. And then they made the pipe out of it like that, bored a hole in it, and then heated the stone and covered it with beeswax and polished it. That made it dark red. And the Indians, of course, also depended on trade goods. This is a, a fish spear made out of iron. And they probably got this from traders as a result of bartering furs for these things that they wanted. A long stick would be fastened on here, on this end. And then this would be thrown at the fish. The Indian would stand there like a statue and wait for a fish to appear and then throw it with deadly aim right at the fish. And then if one of these little barbs here, like this one over here, or this one, if that once got into a fish, the fish might as well say goodbye to his friends. But this is iron. This is trade goods. Well, that shows you something of the implements used by the Indians. <coughs> I told you a moment ago that I wanted to tell you something about the war council in which 
Black Hawk and Keokuk fought for the loyalty of their followers. One wanted to go to war, one, one wanted to remain at peace with the white men. Here is a statue, a front view of the same statue that we can see in the background. I don't know exactly how to hold this so that you get the best light. How's that, Don? All right. Don's one of our cameramen here in Keokuk today. Well, this shows the, the figure of, of Keokuk. And this stone set into the front of the pedestal was the stone which was over the original grave of Keokuk. Incidentally, the, the first name of Keokuk was not Keokuk, but Keokag. K-I-Y-O-K-A-G, Keokag. And in the Sac language, that means a young man who is alert, alert. That is, who is wide-eyed and who notices things about him. And that described Keokuk. Well, on the side here it says, Sacred to the memory of Keokuk, a distinguished Sac chief born at Rock Island in 1780, died in Kansas in April 1848. In 1883, his, re his remains, together with the marble slab on the reverse side of this die, were brought from Franklin County, Kansas, where he died and was buried. His remains, together with other matter of historical value, are deposited at the base of this structure. Keokuk died, as he lived, a man of peace. The moment which was most significant in the lives of both Black Hawk and Keokuk came in 1832 when Black Hawk was driven out of his lands east of the Mississippi River and came to Keokuk's camp on the Iowa River in what is now Iowa. And a war post was set up in the camp and Black Hawk and his warriors danced around this and flung their tomahawks into it indicating that they wanted to go to war. Black Hawk made a long speech in which he recited all of these wrongs against the Indians by the white men. You see, he was trying to get Keokuk's warriors to join him on the war path. And he made such a fine speech that all of Keokuk's warriors wanted to go with him. And, and Black Hawk thought that he had won the day. Then Keokuk got up and said, I will join you. I will go and help fight the white man even though I'm sure we will all be killed because there are many more white men than there are Indians now. But before I go with you, we must first kill all of our old men and women, all of our wives and children, because if we don't do this, the white men will come after we are killed and kill them. So first, before we go to war, we will kill all of our old people, we will kill our wives and children, and bury them very carefully and lovingly here in our own village. And then I will go with you. Well, when Keokuk's warriors heard this, they said, no, sir, we're not going to kill our wives and our parents before we go to war. What kind of a way is that for Indians to do? And Keokuk said, well, that's the way we'll do it. Otherwise, we won't go. And so Keokuk's warriors decided they wouldn't go. They stayed at home, and Black Hawk and a few of his die-hard warriors recrossed the Mississippi River and began the Black Hawk War, which could have only one end. Of course, Black Hawk and his men were defeated. Just as their cause may have been, they were completely outnumbered, and Black Hawk was soon defeated and taken prisoner and then, because Keokuk had refused to go to war with the white men, the President of the United States said, Keokuk is now to be the Grand Chief of all the Sacs and the Foxes. And that is the only time that the Sac and the Fox nations were combined. The Fox Chief didn't like this, but that's what the President said. And so Keokuk, for the rest of his life, was the was the chief of all the <coughs> chief of all the sacks and the foxes.
Of course, Keokuk couldn't stay in his village. It wasn't long before the white men began to push him further west. And for a time, he lived on the Des Moines River. But as time went on, he was pushed further and further west until finally he was as far west as Kansas. And there he died, a very disappointed old man. In his later years, he became almost feeble with drunkenness as he drank more and more whiskey, became more and more unreliable. And there was a rumor that he didn't die of old age, but he died of poison, that one of his own Indians poisoned him because they didn't like him anymore. But we, we like to remember Keokuk today because he was a man of peace. He tried to get along with the white men. He tried to adjust himself to the fact that the white man was coming further and further west and the Indian couldn't do much about it. There is another graveyard in Keokuk, the only national cemetery in Iowa, where the Civil War dead are buried. And the inscription on the monument here might as well describe Keokuk as the Civil War dead. The muffled drum's sad roll has beat the soldier's last tattoo. No more on life's parade shall meet that brave and fallen few. A beautiful place, all the stones the same size, whether the people buried there are officers or privates. <coughs> now let's review in the short time we have left. Keokuk was called the watchful fox, not because he was a Fox Indian, which of course he was not, he was a sack, but because he was shrewd. He believed in having peace. So this could be a picture of Keokuk. And we'll enlarge it a little bit here and see what we get. This begins to look like a war bonnet, doesn't it? So there is Keokuk, when he was a leader. Now let's take a look at Keokuk, when he was disappointed and defeated by the advancing tide of settlement. No more did he smoke the peace pipe, but rather he smoked the pipe of reflection, thinking about the days of glory that were gone, wondering if he made a mistake in being peaceful all the time. Because it hadn't profited him anything after all. So turning it over, we see Keokuk as an old man. Next week, we are going to Burlington and we will visit the first territorial capital of Iowa. I hope you'll be with me then. Goodbye. Today, your teacher has been Herb Haig of Iowa State Teachers College. Landmarks in Iowa History is produced for Iowa TV School Time by WOY-TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. TV School Time is presented daily, Monday through Friday, at 10.30 a.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television.